Hello everybody and welcome back to the History Reader. Today's video is going to be the first read-along video for E.H. Carl's What is History. This is a classic book about the study of history that was published back in 1961. It is originally a series of lectures that E.H. Carr gave at the University of Cambridge, which were then condensed and uh, written down uh, to form the book. And each chapter is one of the lectures. So in that way, it's quite similar to Richard Feynman's kind of foundational physics books, uh, Six Easy Pieces and Six Not So Easy Pieces, which are just chapters taken out of his lectures on physics. Uh, those you can find online. Um, Richard Feynman's books are considered to be some of the best science communication out there. And I would say that this is probably an equivalent for the study of history, uh, though of course it sits in a continuum of our understanding of the study of history. Uh, so a little bit different to the role that Feynman's lectures play. So this is one of the most popular books. I do have my notes here, if you see me looking down. Um, so this is one of the most popular books on history. Um, it's one of those ones that when people apply to universities and stuff, they'll write on here that they read this book and realize that they want to study history. It's been surpassed a little bit in that kind of popularity by Richard Evans in Defense of History, which will be our next entry into this read-along series. Um, but it still is taught. Um, I got taught it in one of my foundational history courses. We read chapters of this book um, and spoke about them in lectures and in classes. So in this video, we're doing chapter one and chapter two. They are titled The Historian and His Facts and Society and the Individual. I don't actually have a copy of the book. I've read it on my Kindle. Uh, I'm trying to find a copy of the book in a local bookshop rather than buying online now that we've opened up here in Sydney, but I'm struggling to find it, uh, which is um, a little bit frustrating, but we'll make do. So chapter one, the historian and his facts. This is probably the most well-known chapter, obviously being chapter one, it sets the groundwork, but it also is a foundational concept in history and a foundational debate in the study of history. What role does the historian play and what role do the facts of history play? So in this chapter, Carr is trying to go through this debate and think through it and come to a conclusion on what role the historian plays. And he has some interesting ways of doing this. So the first thing that Carr does is he explains or he defines the historical fact. And he defines this as a fact that gets uh, used by historians and accepted by historians as being sort of important enough in history to be noted, to be written down, to then be used by other historians um, and perpetuated. Uh, he uses, for example, uh, Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon, which is just Caesar crossing uh, sort of smallest stream really um, which doesn't necessarily have to be an important fact but it in the narrative of history that we have come to understand it is an important fact and so it becomes one of these important uh, these facts of history um, obviously everything that has happened in the past could potentially be a fact of history uh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Now, this is a contentious point. Um, there are people who kind of, there, there are people who criticize Carr for his interpretation here by kind of saying that just because something gets missed by historians um, and sinks into obscurity and we forget about it, doesn't mean it's not important. And there's probably a, fairly dangerous way of looking at what is a historical fact um, because it means that certain stories are going to get forgotten, stories that never got written down. Um, because they never got written down doesn't mean that they're not important and they're not, they're not important to our understanding of what has happened in the past. 
Um, it just means that at some point people didn't think it was important enough. And so there is some criticism here, but we're focusing on what Carr's argument is. One thing that Carr does in at quite some length here is talk about this role of editing original documents to show that even original documents can can not give the full picture of a uh, historical event. So this definition of the fact, though, goes into Carr's argument that even original documents that we're going to look at have been edited to some degree. They're not true representations of the past. They're not for example, like a, a video of the past. We don't have that. We have these documents which have been written by people and we get into this in the second chapter a little bit more, but they've, they're written by people in the past and those people have reasons they're writing those things down. Um, they have unconscious biases. There are things that they are writing down that they want the reader to know. There's things that they want they think they want the reader to know um, and there's things that they just want to think about themselves and those things get written down. One of the examples that he gives here is our understanding of religiosity in the Middle Ages. It's generally accepted that the Middle Ages was quite a religious uh, time uh, but of course we see the Middle Ages through histories written by the clergy and so of course we're going they are going to <laughs> place religion quite high on their list of things that are important um, and so of course that's going to come through in the histories and the chronicles that they write. It doesn't mean that it's wrong um, but it's something that we should be aware of. Um, another example that he uses is Gustav Stresemann's papers. Uh, Gustav Stresemann was the foreign minister in the Weimar Republic and when he died he had a uh, whole collection of his uh, papers, so things like his journals and his diaries and letters and things like that, um, which were then curated by, I believe, a family member and published in several volumes in German. Those several volumes were then uh, translated into English and which we now have. So that English volume that we have places in importance on Stresman's uh, work and negotiations and ev all, all the, the work he did to do with the West as in more important, more impactful than the work he did with the East. Um, after the Second World War, we actually, by luck, came uh, into possession of the original papers, the unedited papers, and we can see the differences in each stage of editing through the original curation and then the translation that these documents went through, what was left out. And it's not left out for any reason necessarily other than just certain people thought things were more interesting or important or whatever. Um, it's not to hide anything necessarily. Um, but it's quite interesting to think about this um, process and Carr even says, look, Stresman was more uh, successful in his dealings with the West and his dealings with the East. So even he had uh, placed these things as more important. Uh, when he wrote in his original papers, he places more importance on the West because they place him in a better light. So this basically all gets down to Carr's argument. He says that it's not possible to write history without some level of interpretation. Um, there's always going to be interpretation in whatever you write down. You can't write down every single fact that happens. You have to edit some things out. And that matters to the history that eventually goes on to get written. He, he's placing this argument in the context of like Rankian history, this idea that the historian's job is to determine what the facts are and let them speak for themselves. Um, Carr says that like this effectively can't happen because the historian does have a role in selecting which facts get presented, they selecting how they get presented, in what context, in what order, 
and that all matters. And even though you can use the same set of facts to come up with two different interpretations or various interpretations of different things, it doesn't make them incorrect, uh, but it means that the historian does have a role. Um, and so that is why we have Carl's dictum of before you study history, study the historian. And that's really what he gets to here in this first chapter. Um, the historian has a very important role to play. And so at the end of the first chapter, Carr comes to this definition of history. And I think it's really, really interesting. So there's two quotes here, actually, I want to pull out. The relation of a man to his environment is the relation of the historian to his theme. The historian is neither the humble slave nor the tyrannical master of his facts. The relation between the historian and his facts is one of equality, of give and take. And then a little bit later he writes, My first answer, therefore, to the question, what is history, is that it is a continuous process of interaction between the historian and his facts, an unending dialogue between the present and the past. And that is his argument here, is that the facts have context, the facts have been edited, um, and the historian has context. Um, and so it's this back and forth. And that then sets us off into the second chapter on society and the individual. And in this chapter, Carr is basically examining the role that the historian plays um, and more broadly, the role that the individual plays in history. Is the individual, and he, he asks the question sort of at the beginning of the chapter, is the individual the important part in history or is society that the individual lives in the important part? And towards the end of the chapter, Carr rejects this debate and he says that this is actually a red herring to throw us off. It is not one or the other. The individual is a part of a society but their, individu their individuality matters. And so there's two questions that he kind of tackles here. One is what does this mean for the historian and the writing of history? And then also what does this mean for how we treat individuals um, in history? So the first part he tackles in quite an interesting way. He states something that probably seems quite obvious to us now that people have a context that they're writing in. We have, we are writing, a historian today is writing in the present, knowing the things that we know now, um, worried about the things that we're worried about now, cognizant of the things and the, and the problems that we have now. And those things then become not necessarily more important in history, but they we are able to see them in a different light because of what we're going through now. There are some perfect examples of this today. Uh, pandemics is one of them. Uh, if you look at sort of any work that's been done on history in the last year or two years, pandemics is a huge part of that. Look at, for example, Dan Jones's uh, and, and this is a perfect example, actually, Dan Jones's new book, Power and Thrones, which is a full history of the Middle Ages, focuses quite a lot on pandemics because we're living through one. And so it informs the way he can understand the past. The other big one today, and it's present through all the way through Powers and Thrones as well, is climate change. Uh, how climate influences the flow of history, influences humans and how that interaction between the climates and humans matters and that is becoming ever more present as in our understanding of history as we grapple with climate change today and so the way that Carr frames this is that history is like a, pro a procession um, like a, 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 a march going through the streets you know you get the procession the at Christmas time and there's the floats and whatnot and historians every person is part of that procession they sit at a point in time uh, what Carr says is that sometimes this is going to this route that this procession takes is going to double back on itself 
meaning that a historian in one part of it is going to be able to see close up something that's happening in the past. And, and that this is that context that's come into play. It is we are living through something now that has happened in the past, and so we can understand, therefore, what's happened in the past. And he has a quote here. Um, is that he says that great history is written precisely when the historian's vision of the past is illuminated by insights into the problems of the present. And, and this is important. Um, the other thing that Carr sort of argues as part of this is that when the historian writes is very important. And so his dictum in the first chapter is that before you study history, study the historian. Um, look for who the historian is. But then he says here, also look for when this was published. History that's written pre-9-11 and post-9-11 is going to be very, very different because the context of the world is different. And so this society is playing a part on the historian, even though we can clearly see the historian is their own being. Now jumping across, looking at this uh, role of the individual in history itself. Um, what role does the, the, does the individual have? Of course, we have this idea of the great man in history, um, and this is what Carr tackles. There are two theories here. One is that the individual can't have any influence on history, that history is just these vast impersonal social forces driving things. Um, other people believe that great men or individuals do have an outsized influence on history. And this has gained popularity again as we go through the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st, because obviously we have very uh, clear examples of people who have played an outsized role in history. Um, we have people like Stalin. We have people like Hitler. They, they have played very large parts in the story of the 20th century, and the 20th century probably would have been quite different without them. So what does Carr come to here? He, it's not surprising when you think about his arguments about the historian. All of these people are products of the history that they are living in. They are products of their time. And Carr's argument is that these great men that arise, and great women as well, are representations of things that are already possible. That the study of history is the study of these individual actions that individuals take, but in the context of their relationships and of their social connections and everything going on around them, that sometimes the effects of their actions are even different to what they wanted those effects to be. And this is really, really uh, important. He says that numbers matter in history. There's a, an interesting quote here. He says that it is easier to call communism the brainchild of Karl, Karl Marx than to analyze its origin and character. To attribute the Bolshevik revolution to the stupidity of Nicholas II or to German gold and to study its profound social causes and to see in the two world wars of this century the result of the individual wickedness of Wilhelm II and Hitler rather than some deep-seated breakdown in the system of international relations. And so what he really gets to here, um, and this is a quote that uh, I pulled out, he says that the view which I would hope to discourage is the view which places great men outside history and sees them as imposing themselves on history in virtue of their greatness, as jack-in-the-boxes who emerge miraculously from the unknown to interrupt the real continuity of history. Um, and another quote here, we have history then, in both senses of the word, meaning both the inquiry conducted by the historian and the facts of the past into which he inquires is a social process in which individuals are engaged as social beings and the imaginary antithesis between society and the individual is no more than a red herring drawn across our path and to confuse our thinking. And so Carr comes to the conclusion here that 
the individual matters, the individual does things, and it's important for us to understand why the individual does those things and why the individual thought they did those things, but also to look at what the effects were on a grander scale and to understand that the individual is a product of the time and place in which they live and is all the historian is also a product of the time and place in which they live and understanding both of those things can allow us both to write better history but also to understand history that we read in a deeper and more profound way so those are the first two chapters hope you enjoyed them uh, if you did enjoy the video please leave a like on it and subscribe uh, I'll be doing two more of these, so two chapters in the next video, two chapters in the final video for this uh, series, and I hope to see you in those ones too. Thanks for watching. Bye.